welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. I'm Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I invite you to check out and read over 4,000 of my written reviews. Quipster.net is where to go, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to click the link to my other podcast. It's called the Quipster Film Review Podcast, where I cover more recent movies that have been out in theaters, VOD, or streaming services. You can check out the link for that at Quipster.net. Today I'm going to be getting into the second part of this three-part series looking at films that are partially or fully set outside of Earth but somewhere in the solar system. Last week I looked at Total Recall from 1990, a film that has Mars as the setting for most of the second half. Today we're going to go just a little bit further out into the solar system to Jupiter. Well, actually a moon off of Jupiter for 1981's Outland. Outland is an R-rated film. It does have brutal violence throughout, brief strong language, and partial nudity. The runtime is an hour and 49 minutes. Sean Connery is the main star. Peter Boyle, Francis Sternhagen are supporting players. James Siking, Kika Markham, and Clark Peters also appear. The director and the screenwriter for Outland is Peter Hyams. Now, before I get to the making of this movie, as well as my thoughts on it, I will tell you... A little bit about the story. It's set sometime in the future, kind of the near future, I suppose. Humans have established mining operations throughout the solar system. The one that we are covering in Outland is one on Io. Io is a volcanic moon that is orbiting Jupiter. It's about a week's distance from the nearest space station, we learn. The mining base is currently shattering records for productivity there. Sean Connery, he plays a man named William T. O'Neill. It's O'Neill's second week of this one-year stint as the federal district marshal of this isolated space community, the miners there, but also some of their families, sometimes other workers are there too. Work hard, play hard is the motto of the mining operations general manager, played by Peter Boyle. His name is Mark Shepard, and Shepard touts the production numbers as proof that his philosophy of work hard, play hard really works. The marshal, though, is alarmed because there is an increasing rash of suicides there, violent outbursts among the miners for no apparent reason. No autopsies have been ordered. The bodies are loaded on departing shuttles, and they're disposed of through a burial in space. So whatever the biological reason, if there is one, it's not just psychological. Maybe they're just going nuts from being cooped up in a space cavern for nearly a year. Well, he's going to get to the bottom of this. O'Neill's wife says that she's going to leave him here if he's going to continue his new assignment because she wants their young son, who's been shuttled around all over space for all of his life to all the various locations where O'Neill takes a job, she wants him to experience a normal life on Earth, breathe real air. Nobody else, not even his deputies, though, wants to rock the boat to get to the reason why there are so many suicides among the miners. By monitoring Shepard's goons, O'Neill discovers that the company is selling the workers this amphetamine-like synthetic narcotic that produces, among them, hyperactivity. And this hyperactivity exponentially increases their productivity, each of these miners, averaging the sum of doing 14 hours worth of work during their six-hour shift, and that's pretty great for their bonuses, but the drug does carry a pretty nasty side effect for some of them. Yes, you guessed it. Bouts of severe psychosis after nearly a year of taking the drug. So the marshal decides this really cannot continue. The company is going to do anything, though, to assure that O'Neill is out of the way, so their gravy train is going to keep rolling along. And that's where... The stage is set for the showdown of this film. Now, after completing 1979's Hanover Street, the writer and director of Outland, Peter Hyams, he wanted to make a Western. However, Westerns had been falling out of favor at the box office throughout the 1970s. Richard Roth, who was a producer who helped Hyams with his 1974 romantic feature called Our Time, he advised to find something new, something other than a Western. So Hyams went to his sons because they were just about to come upon their teenage years. What would be a good litmus test on what could be successful if he were to do it as a movie project? So he asked his sons what their favorite movies were, and both boys were very huge on Star Wars. Now, Hyams observed that Star Wars really borrowed a lot from Western tropes. He didn't understand why 
Star Wars would be so successful, but all of these other westerns were considered passé. Well, he realized that science fiction was becoming red hot at the box office, so he figured that maybe he could make his western if he could find a way to set it in space. So thinking about a science fiction western, Hyams observed that science fiction movies made living in space look like such wonderful fun. Hyams, he used to be a reporter before he became a filmmaker. He covered space missions for NASA, and he knew that space was, in actuality, a pretty dangerous and hostile place for humans. A space settlement would, in reality, be like like a frontier settlement when Americans would be going west and exploring. Now, life would be difficult and dangerous being away from the creature comforts of civilization for so long, especially in the vacuum of outer space. Hardy people, just as in the frontier days, they endured adverse conditions for fast monetary opportunities like mining for valuable metals or oil and... Hyams thought that it could be interesting to take this frontier like Dodge City and place it somewhere out there on a planet in the future. The frontier would be less about trying to plant a flag for your country than it would be to mine fuels, mine metals, find materials to make corporations who would be able to fund such a costly expedition a fortune. So we as humans would go to other planets for these metals and minerals and Mining communities would crop up resembling modern oil rigs, perhaps. Like these frontier towns from a hundred years ago, people who had a checkered past would leave Earth hoping to turn things around for making a quick fortune. They would be most willing to endure the terrible living conditions of what a space colony would be because they didn't really have a lot to lose on Earth at home. These would be probably rough Blue-collar folk, they would be exploitable, well away from civilized society. They were definitely going to be dependent on the company that they work for and the resources they provide out there in the coldness of space. Hyams also felt that if his story could avoid science fiction staples like laser guns and battles with alien monsters, that his movie might actually attract beyond genre fans, those who don't normally find science fiction appealing, could still find a way to identify with his story. It would target adults who were old enough not only to understand westerns, but also film noir detective tales, because he was going to introduce a lawman into the body of his film. The future would be grounded to real-life depictions of frontier life, except for obvious advancements in technology and industry. The complications we would find of living within this enclosed environment on another planet, that would be a new wrinkle. But Hyams determined he was not going to pepper the future with a bunch of Flash Gordon-type doohickeys. The future should resemble a very logical extension of where we are now and where we will be 100 years from now. So Hyams wanted to restrict the futuristic frontier to be within our solar system instead of a billions of light years away in some sort of other galaxy. That was way, way into the future from where he wanted to be. Now, as he was coming up with his concepts for his screenplay, on the news, NASA space probes known as Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they were sending back pictures of their travels. And Hyams found, in particular, the images of Jupiter particularly striking and imposing because of its enormous scale. It was something well beyond his comprehension. He thought about how on Earth, the moon is the largest thing that you see in the sky at night, but Jupiter has to take up most of the sky if you were viewing it from one of its moons, making it particularly an amazing visual backdrop if he could make a film on one of those moons. So Hyams, he gathered up a bunch of astronomy books at the local library. He tried to learn as much as he could about Jupiter and all of its surrounding moons. Of the moons, he liked the look of Io, the volcanic third moon of Jupiter, which he decided merited further exploration as his setting. So Hyams began to think of this mining operation resembling an oil rig that would be based on Io's volcanic surface. It would be fully enclosed to provide oxygen to its inhabitants. Not everything there is going to be clean or safe or work without a hitch. You know, everybody there would probably get cabin fever. They would start going crazy, being out of their comfort zone without any kind of outlets. In addition to working hard, they need to play just as hard there. So they needed perpetual distractions to keep their minds occupied. Drugs and sex and all kinds of ways to find tranquility. Even if it happens to be manufactured, the interiors would probably resemble a penal colony. Cramped, very claustrophobic. The companies would want their workers to work while they were there. They didn't want their abodes to be very appealing. They didn't want them to hang around at home. They wanted their living spaces to only contain the basic necessities so they could get them to work another day. 
Now, the themes for Hayam's story would delve into how corporate greed, if it was left unchecked, would result in rampant corruption and the dehumanization of this community. People of integrity, people who value duty and honor and sacrifice, they probably wouldn't feel brave enough to take a stand for what's right because they're wholly dependent on the corporation to feed their families with the money and being out in space relying on all, any creature comfort that they could provide would make them very vulnerable to exploitation. Unlike other science fiction stories, the monsters would not be out there somewhere in space. They are within our society. It is humanity and our quest for more money, more power within our society. After three months of research and writing, Hyams completed his first draft for his new space western. He entitled it Io, just like the planet. He saw Io like high noon, but set in outer space. It would feature a lawman within this mining community. He would be alone against ruthless killers in the climax. Allusions to that classic 1952 Western would appear throughout the film, including a ticking clock announcing the arrival of the bad guys coming to take the marshal down, so he would not interfere with the company's desire to maintain productivity by using their narcotic. He retitled Io to Outland after he started shopping around this script, and studio executives thought Io, I-O, looked like 10, which happened to be, in 1979, a pretty big hit at the movies. 10, made by Blake Edwards, of course, starring Bo Derek and Dudley Moore. Universal Pictures took up the property, but they soon lost interest. Other studios were definitely willing to give it a go. Richard Roth, he once had a development deal with 20th Century Fox. Under its president, Alan Ladd Jr., Ladd was at Fox greenlighting huge hits like Star Wars and Alien, definitely influences on Outland. Ladd and many other executives at Fox recently left to form a new film production house called The Ladd Company. Hyams chose The Ladd Company to take over what would become Outland over all of these other interested studios because it would be their first high-profile film. They had done before in 1980 Bette Midler's concert film called Divine Madness, but this was really their first narrative feature. Hyams felt that the Lad Company would put extra effort in making sure Outland had everything needed to be a success. And Hyams was right. The Lad Company scrutinized everything in his script. The script underwent six revisions before the production began. The Lad Company was willing to budget Outland at about $14 million. The set design that they envisioned, they wanted it to resemble the blue-collar look of Alien in its aesthetic, especially since it was coinciding with the working-class characters at the mercy of corporate interests, which is a theme of Alien. Hyams opted against using laser guns or robots or ostentatious space shots. Technology would be utilitarian instead of eye candy for Outland. For the lead character, Hyams wrote O'Neill to be cast with a middle-aged actor, and on his shortlist among those were Sean Connery, Gene Hackman, and Paul Newman. Elliot Gould, who had done prior films with Hyams, was also in consideration if those guys passed. Sean Connery was Hyams' first choice because he exuded the requisite resolve and strength, and he also conveyed a genuine vulnerability under it all. Connery did accept the role, primarily because he found that films set in space were making big money at the box office, and he wanted a big hit to shake the image of himself as James Bond. He had not had a lot of hits outside of the James Bond franchise, and he wanted to make a claim for himself in something else. Science fiction proved to be resurgent at the box office. Star Wars, of course, being the biggest hit of all time, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Alien, Star Trek The Motion Picture were all doing amazing international numbers. Connery wanted to be in a hit just like that, but he didn't really understand personally science fiction. He never was somebody who read comic books as a kid. He fell asleep watching Superman in theaters back in 1978, and he pretty much woke up whenever the audience cheered, which was way too often for his taste. Star Wars was another bore to him. He had no idea why it became such a phenomenon. Outland to him was different. This was essentially a Western, and Connery liked Westerns. He had made a Western before. He had starred with Bridget Bardot in 1968's Shalico, but that one did not turn out to his satisfaction. Here was a chance to do a Western that could prove financially successful by putting it into outer space. 
Connery also wanted to work with Peter Hyams because he was both the writer and director. He tended to favor directors that also wrote their own material because he wanted to iron out the problems with the script in pre-production instead of wasting a lot of time during the shoot trying to get all of this resolved. He regarded Hyams as a first-rate director, but he wasn't really a great writer. He had a good idea for a story here, but several elements needed more work. Connery felt that the script was too black and white in its approach to its heroes and its villains. Modern audiences were likely to find it too predictable to find entertaining, so he encouraged Hyams to add more dimension to the characters and to add more doubt in whether there was going to be a happy resolution at the end. Connery liked the conflict for his character being the abandonment of his family. That would be a major pressure on O'Neill to hang up the badge, but that wasn't going to be enough to sustain a big climax. There had to be a reason that O'Neill wanted to stay besides being a good guy. So they wrote in that his character finds that he's been assigned to this backwater location, so to speak, because that's where they typically put ineffective and undistinguished lawmen like him. O'Neill is stubborn. He mouths off to his superiors way too often for their taste. So they've punished him by sticking him where he's not going to cause them that much trouble, at least so they think. Because once O'Neill figures this out, he wants to prove that he's worth much more than what they claim. Connery took an active role. Besides starring in the film, he, he was heavily involved behind the scenes. He urged Hyams, for one thing, to relocate from Hollywood to London's Pinewood Studios because they had a pretty good track record for making space adventures and because he had not worked there in some time. He wanted to do more films there, but as a resident of Spain, Connery had left the United Kingdom because of their oppressive taxes, he felt. He was only allowed to spend 90 days a year in the UK unless he wanted to pay a hefty tax penalty. Now, once Hyams completed his last revision to Connery's approval, he would accept no further changes to keep things on schedule. While they were waiting for the shoot to begin, Connery, instead of staying in the UK, traveled to Morocco to appear in a cameo role in Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits. And once he returned to the UK, things were underway with Outland, but the shoot threatened to go over schedule pretty soon. As the deadline started to draw near, Connery began flying out of the country every weekend to avoid those extra two days pushing him toward that 90-day limit. Connery also made suggestions on how the sets should be designed, the casting choices within the film. He thought the men should wear beards that would further evoke the frontier aesthetic. Connery here, he actually does give a suitably understated performance. He's very charismatic, very intense in this film. He's probably the best thing about Outland. If you're a huge Sean Connery fan, I definitely think you'll get a kick out of what he delivers here. I think his best scene is his most emotional, maybe his most emotional in almost all of his films. He's tearfully watching this transmission sent by his young son leaving for Earth. The performance by the son, who's obviously just reading off of cue cards or something, is not that great, but Connery still manages to make it an emotional scene. Stage actress Frances Sternhagen, she's terrific as the acerbically funny smartass called Dr. Marion Lazarus. This was a role that Peter Hyams had written with Charles Durning in mind, but Sean Connery thought that the banter that's in the script would work better if the character were a woman. He suggested Colleen Dewhurst, but Dewhurst was unavailable, so Hyams' sister Nessa, she was a casting director at Warner Brothers, she recommended Frances Sternhagen as having similar qualities. So Hyams overrode the producer's request for somebody with box office appeal because he wanted somebody very strong to anchor that role. Sternhagen based her performance on a woman that she knew who experienced a lot of disappointments in her life, but she had always determined to make the best out of whatever bleak situations come her way. Her sense of cynical and derisive attitude fuels a lot of the humor as her defense mechanism. And when she meets O'Neill, she admires him. He's a man of integrity. He does not succumb to the corruption or indifference that everybody else she's met within the mining community exudes. Now, Hyams did not want the mining colony to look outwardly beautiful because it's on Io. Nobody's going to really see it from the outside. So it was built for functionality and to protect the life that is held within primarily. The colony model was about one two hundredth scale. It took about 80 technicians, about three months to make a lot of small fiber optic lights, thousands of them all over this thing to look like real lights. There was a working little elevator in there, solar panels on it that uh, are meant to provide power, a rotating radar scanner that all gives the impression that it's a self-sustaining community, but also has communication to the outside. 
This was an 18 foot miniature edifice. It was inspired by the look of oil rigs on earth, but definitely contained because it's an environment where there's no oxygen outside. Now Outland made a lot of news at the time because it was employing a new visual effects process called IntroVision. And that was this plated system that seamlessly puts live actors in front of this giant 60 foot front projected screen. And they could also be behind objects in front of them. And it looks like they are within the environments captured live on the set. So because it was captured live and they could actually see the footage on the dailies, this would avoid the lengthy delays for external blue screen or optical processing or having to create giant sets for all of these actors. Little people did stand in for the actors when they were doing external shots in space when they had their spacesuits on and that would provide additional scale to their models. Using the intervision method, the film only had to pay about a third of the cost of doing the same with blue screen effects. So it was a big savings there. It even looked better and more convincing to a lot of people who were watching that film at the time. Jerry Goldsmith, he was the composer for Alien famously, but he also worked with Peter Himes before for Capricorn One, probably his biggest hit before Outland. Goldsmith was working here with a new six track stereo process, a Dolby process dubbed by Warner Brothers in its marketing as Mega Sound. There were only a handful of Mega Sound films that had really come out in the early 1980s. Goldsmith found Outland particularly difficult because he wasn't able to grasp the human element of the characters. Consequently, he feels that the emotional component of the score isn't really as connected. It's not as emotional as he would like it to be. A lot of people find that the score for Outland actually is quite similar in some respects to the one he did for Alien. Now, Hyams did his own cinematography for Outland. Stephen Goldblatt actually is the credited person for the cinematography, but he was really chosen here just to appease the union, the American Society of Cinematographers. Hyams had been trying to get into that union for a long time, but they actually rejected Hyams from being a member for decades. It was kind of a almost a running thing. They felt that they despised him and they never were gonna let him in. He displays here a lot of nimble camera work. He blew the image up to 70 millimeters for the theatrical release. There's a really good foot chase in the middle of this film through the steely corridors. It's actually very imaginative, very compelling. A great foot chase for this film. Actually, it's more exciting for a lot of people than the climactic showdown, which is kind of a liability for the film toward the end. John Steers, he worked on Star Wars. He worked on several James Bond films, including those done by Sean Connery. He headed the visual effects here. He gave a shifting look to the sulfurous molten ground of the volcanic nature of Io. The miniature mining colony was presumably placed on stilts to remain stationary while the ground, the molten ground shifted around it. Now, viewers who are bothered by questionable science, questionable human motivation, you may have a harder time enjoying Outland outright because this is really more of a genre piece, a genre exploration. This definitely does not strive to be absolutely accurate in its science. Hyams, who was not a scientist, he actually just wanted to be accurate to where he thought human race would go. The science just had to be plausible enough for most people to buy in order to deliver the Western that he wanted on top of it. Now, there are implausible or unexplained story elements for nitpickers. You know, this is not going to stand up to a lot of scrutiny because you might wonder how they achieve Earth's gravity within the mining compound when the moon is only 18% of the gravitational pull of Earth. Even if you're one foot outside of the exterior of the compound, if you think that there's some artificial way that they're doing it, you don't have the gravitational pull there for some reason. Now, in another scene, O'Neill extracts blood with a needle from somebody who's been deceased for some time. Try to get a blood sample. You know, all the blood should be at the bottom of his body, not the top of his neck when he's laying down. That would even happen in lower gravity. So the blood also looks way too bright and it has the liquid consistency of Tabasco sauce when you see it. It almost looks like they're sloshing around Kool-Aid. There are a lot of questions beyond science left by the screenplay. More character motivations here. Like, why would a mouthy upstart like O'Neill be sent to a place where they don't expect him to clean house? And why doesn't O'Neill, once he has obtained evidence and the culprits start making confessions in front of him, why doesn't he arrest Shepard instead of allow him to continue to pull whatever strings are necessary to put an end to not only the investigation, but also his life, presumably? And why doesn't he record all of this evidence that he finds or these confessionals? And why does he flush the evidence down the toilet? At least that's what he says he does. 
And once the assassins start to come, why is he not spending more time preparing with a lot more tactical strategies or booby traps? He sets a few of them, but definitely not enough. He seems to be more into drinking and idling rather than preparing for the oncoming battle with hardened assassins. And why did they all carry firearms within this compound that easily could destroy their operation? They could blow a hole into the wrong spot in the wall and all of them are going to suffer. And of course, this all comes into play. I think also as a High Noon remake, it doesn't quite translate. For instance, the lawman, if you watch High Noon, he's protecting a town full of very timid, very scared folk who are too frightened to take on these hardened killers. Now in Outland, the townspeople are not these timid type. They're actually burly miners. They're used to fighting amongst each other. Death, as it turns out, tends to be a nearly daily reality in those parts. So life is cheap. They definitely would not have as much to lose. I guess the assumption here is that these men are morally compromised by the money that is flowing in. They don't perceive any physical threat unless they make waves, so they're not going to make any waves. They're not going to stop that proverbial gravy train from coming in. Now, they did a couple of preview screenings for this film with an audience, and that revealed that the ending did land a lot flatter than they had anticipated. So they decided to do some tightening up of the climax. Four and a half minutes actually is trimmed off of that. There were a lot of tracking shots up and down hallways. And in the newly edited version, we are only shown two assassins and there actually turns out to be three. They edited that climax out so that that third would be a complete surprise to the audience once we do see who that person is. However, it still wasn't a satisfying conclusion for most people because it was not as exciting as the chase that they saw in the middle of the film. It still landed somewhat flat for a lot of people, and Outland resulted in a disappointment at the box office in the United States. It ended up only taking in $17 million off of that $14 to $16 million investment. It was a bigger hit in some European markets, though. Sean Connery's star power was very potent in some parts of the world, and the popularity of science fiction was actually prominent in those parts as well. Critics, though, in the United States were pretty mixed on Outland. Some did find it a very intelligent change of pace for the movie theaters. Others did proclaim Outland a dull formula story that had science fiction used mostly as a gimmick. Those who despise Outland do point out the glaring plot holes and the frustratingly obtuse character motivations contrived to keep the narrative tied to High Noon, even when it made little sense. So it's kind of a mixed bag. You may love it. It may drive you mad. But if you're a Sean Connery fan or if you're a fan of Westerns, you're probably going to be a lot more forgiving to find Outland ultimately quite entertaining. Now, personally speaking, I do think that it's not as exciting as it probably strives to be. It does feature, though, an interesting dilemma, and it has very good character actors that are very worth watching. I do think that it delivers pretty good drama and thrills, and that will keep most audiences, I think, interested in where it goes, even if the unevenness of the story and those perplexing character motivations may dog those prefer their science fiction concepts to be scientific. So for me, I do think that this is a pretty good genre film. I love Westerns. I love science fiction films. Two great tastes that taste great together, so to speak. And I do think that Outland ultimately is a worthwhile film, enough for me to give it three stars out of four. Three stars on my scale means I do think that this is a film that you should probably seek out if you like this kind of movie. If you're a fan of Westerns and sci-fi, especially if you like both, I think you're going to get more out of Outland than most other people. Certainly, if you're a Sean Connery fan, it's almost in the must-see category. I think he definitely delivers a great action hero here outside of Bond. Very different, very vulnerable, and it does capitalize on his talent as an actor, which a lot of his roles tended not to do because a lot of people saw him as James Bond during this period. So three stars out of four is what I give Outland. Kind of as a coincidence, Sean Connery's next film that he did after Outland was called Five Days, One Summer, and that was directed by the man who directed 1952's High Noon, Fred Zinnemann himself. How's that for a coincidence? Now, there was a remake that was discussed in 2009 of Outland. It was going to be directed by Michael Davis. He was the director of 2007's film called Shoot 'em Up, the Clive Owen film. The Western influences of Outland were going to be mostly removed here. It was going to be much more of a tentpole type blockbuster and the plot would involve a cop 
discovering a deadly conspiracy threatening the city that's orbiting Earth's moon. The cop has to decide whether he's going to leave with his wife or he's going to take on an army of goons with only a couple of allies at his side. I guess you could anticipate where it was going to go or there was not going to be much of a movie. It was scheduled for a 2012 release, but for some reason it just never developed. And so the remake of Outland did not happen. However, my theory is it actually didn't happen because in 2009, the same year that this was announced, Duncan Jones came out with a movie called Moon. And Moon has a lot of heavy influences by Outland. So if you see Outland and you watch Moon, you'll see a lot of the influences that Duncan Jones had, not only from Outland, but a lot of films of the 70s and early 1980s. There's a, a mining operation there, I guess, fuel in this case, a digital clock countdown to an arrival, a, a dodgy corporation, a lot of that is in the mix. So if you are disappointed that there was never a remake, I guess check out Moon from 2009. And that's as close as you're probably going to come, at least for now. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this look at Outland. If you have your own thoughts on this film that you want to impart, you can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. Links to my Twitter feed, Facebook page, and Instagram are also there. Any of those ways to get in touch with me is fine by me. As far as what I'm going to be covering next week, well... <laughs> Let's go a little bit further out into the solar system. We just went from Mars and the next planet was Jupiter. Let's go one more planet. Let's go to Saturn for a film called Saturn 3, starring Kirk Douglas, Farrah Fawcett, and Harvey Keitel, and somebody who voiced over Harvey Keitel. Keitel refused to do the voiceover for reasons I will get into on next week's show. Boy, talk about crazy movie and a crazy production. I can't wait to get into that film. Until then, thank you so much for listening and joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies. (laughs) 